All right. In three, two, one. Welcome back. Second segment of the My Aggie Nation podcast. We're, we're, we're kind of, we're, 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 we're being efficient here, guys, because over here at the Eagle, we wanted to have a little season preview. We wanted to talk a little A&M football with the Eagle crew, Robert Cessna, Alex Miller, myself. Uh, but we also had this podcast to record, 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 record with me and Zach Taylor, who were also going to do kind of a football season preview. So, you know, why not, like Captain Planet, combined our forces for good and just all talk about Aggie football. So without further ado, we have a little Aggie round table, Robert Cessna with the Eagle, Alex Miller, the Eagle. And then of course we've already had Zach Taylor on here. So Zach Taylor, we're going to talk a little bit of Aggie football. What do you say guys? Worlds are Talks colliding. Aggie football. I think this is the Mount Rushmore of podcasts. I'll be uh, Thomas Jefferson, I guess. I don't know. Or who, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, there you go, there you go. So, I, we can just start with this. How surprised are any of you that we are at this point, that we we're just over a little little over a week away from the first A&M football game of the season? First of all, I got to opt out. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's going to be a real big hit. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, yeah, we, we can talk about that a little bit later. But, uh, I mean, I, you do have to kind of pinch yourself every now and then because you honestly didn't know if this day was going to come. I, I thought that it, it always would, but there was that part, that thing in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I don't know if this is going to actually work or not. I don't know if they're finally going to come around to this or not. Uh, you know, the future is is kind of scary. have no idea what's going to happen with, with COVID-19 and the pandemic, but – the fact that they're able to work that out and not only have games, but have fans in the stands, I think is, is uh, I wouldn't say surprising, but it's, it's nice for sure. Yeah, I go back to the fact is I've been to two high school volleyball games that had fans in it. And I go, I am really going to go cover an A&M football game. And yes, there might be only, 20 some thousand there, but it's going to be AM football. And it's not only going to be AM football, it's going to be an SEC, uh, you know, league game. It's not going to be Northeastern, Southwestern Missouri. I mean, it's going to be somebody that has, you know, 85 scholarship players in a Power Five conference. And while we can laugh and say, oh, AM's just going to wipe the floor with, uh, with Vanderbilt, watch some of these other games last couple weeks with the kicking game and what have you and COVID. I don't know what we're going to get there at Kyle Field next Saturday, except a game. Yeah, it definitely, uh, there were moments where the season seemed bleak this summer. Uh, you go back to August, kind of that weekend where the Big Ten and the Pac-12 canceled, and then it was the we want to play movement. Uh, it, it, it looked – it looked like it was going to fold and you knew the sec was going to hold out as long as they could. And it looks like everybody's kind of gotten their ducks in a row and we got less than 10 days to kick off. So here we are. Ye of little faith. I just, I, I knew we were going to have football right from the get go. And just I'm knew it. And I'm lying. Um, <laughs> I knew we were too, but it, I figured it was going to be 2021. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So, as we head into this Aggie season, there's, there's a lot to, to digest, a lot to, to think about when you think about going into each game. What's the one biggest storyline that each one of you is the most interested in with this, not only this college football season, but specifically this A&M football season? Do I get to go first? Because I feel like these other guys are probably going to echo what I'm saying, but who's going to be the Aggies leading wide receiver with Jamon Osmond having opted out? I mean, how much is that going to affect the offense? Is it going to affect it at all? Is it going to be, I mean, a large part of Jalen Watermeyer, a guy who really showed out at, at tight end last year. But, I mean, gosh, he can't, he can't carry the load the entire year through the passing game. So who is going to be that next guy up? Who's going to be the guy that steps up and is the, the Aggies' leading receiver? And I, I – there's a lot of really young, talented guys that you can go through. I mean, DeMond DeMoss, uh, you could talk about him. You could talk about Anaya Smith possibly going back out to wide receiver. Um, 
But I right now, at least before the season gets started, that's the big storyline for me. Mine is, can A&M take the next step? I thought three, four months ago before pandemic, A&M was going to be an easy 10-win season. And for some reason in college football, 10-win season just means success. Everybody goes like, wow. And you looked, well, maybe they'll lose at Auburn. Maybe they'll lose at Alabama. Uh, maybe they'll even lose another game. But then, you know, they'll come back, uh, you know, uh, win the ball game. 10 and three, uh, you're going to, this is going to be a 10 win season. It's going to be, you're going to be able to paint this to be a successful season. And I still think it goes back to, you got Georgia, you know, you've got Florida, you've got, and to me, you've got Alabama and who else? I don't, I don't think LSU can put up there right now with so many losses, but I thought A&M with the schedule and everything was being positioned to be that fourth team, go up there and be in the upper echelon and then everything has kind of gone south since then. Uh, not going to play that many games. Uh, guess what? You get to play Florida and Tennessee as well. And so now, and I know the lawn situation off the field, Osmond not on the field, all these other things. But my deal is when it's all said and done, when the smoke clears, whether A&M plays nine games, 10 games, or 11 games, does this take team take a big step forward in Jimbo's third year? That that's actually what I was thinking coming off the if we walked off the field and used to, you know, next year would be the year that he would take a big step forward. And that's still my question. And I think it's more difficult now to say they will. Yeah, and Cease talks about can A and M take the next step? And I know Cease and I have talked in the office of line can they take the next step I mean it starts up front they return four guys they return four seniors on the offensive line both tackles they got Kenyon Green kind of the stud sophomore now he started every game as a freshman but can they can they be better up front um, can they protect Kellen better can they get bigger holes for Isaiah Spiller and Anaya Smith uh, who takes over at center I mean these are uh, that's an unanswered you know, Cease and I talked the other day. You go back and look at that 2018 season. Who did they have? They had Eric McCoy, and he started as a rookie for the Saints. He was a valuable piece to that offensive line in 2018. Thank you. So, Appreciate it. Now, where does AM and m go uh, in, with this offensive line? Can they take that next step, especially when you return a bunch of guys? They're, you look around the league, and kind of those teams where a in the middle, you look at Auburn, they don't, they don't return – LSU's kind of in the same boat, and A&M's a different story. So it, it starts up front if you're going to win in this league, and A&M needs its offensive line to come through in a big way this fall. I talked to a bunch of uh, former players before – when it first came out that this was going to be a 10-game all-conference slate, and the one thing that they harped on the most is that this is going to be a season that's won in the training room. That that a lot of times, you know, when we went back and talked – asked. Travion Williams, what his biggest steps were as he continued to, to move out of his career. He said, learning how to get in the training room, to be uh, intentional about his, re, you know, his, his keeping his body healthy throughout the season. And I think especially when we talk about a young wide receiver core and some young talent out there, it, it's going to be won by the team that takes the best care of its body, whether that be the, 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 the rigors that's a 10-game all-SEC slate or staying healthy from COVID. So I, I think my biggest thing I'm looking out for is how well, and something that we won't necessarily know until we show up on game day, but how well are these teams taking care of themselves in the training rooms? You know, and I think what's funny, Travis, is if you'd ask all those guys you talk to, none of them would have expected Jamon Osmond not to be with this team. And I think that goes back to there's so many unknowns we're talking about which we started I didn't think we'd see a football game in September I thought it would the season be pushed back to November December and of course Cease was wrong again but once again the unknowns and we have so many unknowns every year in college football I mean we went in last year as Alex said uh, last year that offensive line I thought would be better than it was and it wasn't. Now we can talk about the offensive line. We can talk about COVID. We can talk about Osmond. We can talk about the physicality. None of us know what t playing 10 SEC games are going to do. You're right. There are so many unknowns 
Uh, it's great to be a writer. It'd be even be great if we could actually have inter interact with the coaches and players besides, uh, you know, doing Zoom. And I guess Elko's still the defensive coordinator. You know, it'd be nice to talk to him. He, these kind of things, you talk about unknowns. What a season of unknowns. And it'd be our job to try to answer some of those unknowns. Yeah, yeah. Well, you were, you might, if, if you want to, go ahead and count yourself a point. You might've been right about the big 12. I mean, excuse me, the big 10 uh, starting in, in November, or December. Um, so, so you, you bring up a good point. Uh, a point. <laughs> come on, Osmond. I know it's something that we want to talk about. It's, it's kind of a, a, a hot issue right now. Of course, the, 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 the uh, upperclassman wide receiver um, going to be the, the, the leader was talking about how much fun he was having. Uh, the coaches were talking about how much he's, slimmed down and got faster and was ready for the season last week. He, or, or excuse me, the beginning of this week, he puts out a statement that he's going to opt out and uh, prepare for uh, the, the NFL draft. Is this, is this a smart move guys? What do, what do we think about this move? I, I know it's one that we're probably all pretty surprised about. Well, just having talked with Jamon over the years, I mean, he's an intelligent guy. Um, you know, he's smart. I, I, I don't think he believes that he is a top three round pick. I would have a hard time – if someone is giving him that advice, then that's the wrong advice, at least based on the stats that you've seen in the NF, uh, in so far in his collegiate career. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it has to be something else, whether or not it was – he didn't see eye-to-eye -eye with, with Jimbo Fisher or there was another reason. You know, I know that A&M has already had one player that said because of Black Lives Matter they're going to be sitting out. Perhaps it was a social justice issue for Jamon, but – I have, I have such a hard time wrapping my mind around, no, it's because I think I really have a shot at being a top three-round pick, and so I'm going to sit out to make sure that, A, I stay away and stay healthy from COVID, and, B, I just stay healthy from not being on the field. I really have a hard time believing that's the reason. Really, the honor percent, Zach, because I think, why would you, you know, set out – to work on the NFL draft where you're not going to get drafted now. I mean, every, every board I see, and the deal is you only get better for the draft by playing and increasing your stock. So I'm with you. What is point B and point C? And I don't know what those are. Well, you know, here's, here's a little bit of a counterpoint that I, I raised with Cease. And I know it's, it's a little bit of a stretch, but if you look back at Christian Kirk's junior year, his last year at A&M, he was a guy that they that it was a young wide receiver core. He was the oldest guy. It was not too dissimilar to the situation that Jamon Osmond would be coming into this year. Christian Kirk statistically did not have a great junior year because he was the decoy most of the season. He was the guy that was getting double teamed for most of the season, and they had to have other guys step up and carry the load when it came to receiving yards. So you could easily look at this team, especially with the injury of Cam Buckley um, a couple weeks ago. You could easily look at this team and, and, and say, hey, I'm going to get doubled every single play of every single down of every single game this season. Maybe, maybe this is the best tape I'm going to be able to put out because if I'm already a, a, a fringe draft guy and I get doubled the entire season and he's not necessarily the prototypical X type receiver that – you can throw the ball up and he's going to go over top guys and, and, and get stuff over. I mean, he's a possession, probably in the NFL slot type receiver. It, it, being double doesn't fit his game. So maybe he thinks that coming out, working out might be better than putting up bad film because he's getting doubled and, and, and can't necessarily break out of that double team. I don't know. It, it's a little bit of a stretch, I'll admit, but it, it's a thought. Yeah, I think regardless, it's just a very puzzling thing because when we talked to him at the beginning of fall camp, he told us he was having the most fun he's ever had. So, and then all of a sudden he's not with the team and then he opts out. So either he was lying, <laughs> something changed very quickly, which is odd because you go back and you consider he came back and it sounded like he was on a mission. He wanted to do something bigger. He wanted to compete for a championship you know he was a team captain last year he was going to be a team captain again this year likely so it, it, it's very puzzling just the the sudden change in his decision and then here we are and now wide receiver is a big question mark for a 
Yeah, if you, if you, it should be said that if you look on social media and those who claim to be close to, to, to Jamon or, or kind of know, say that he, he's, he's going through something. There, there's something that he's going through that, that weighs on this decision. So, of course, you have to be sensitive to stuff that we are not privy to that um, could be going, going on in his life as well. Okay, you bring up Kirk, and I think that's a great point. Uh, a couple things uh, there, Travis, that I'll point out because number one is, you know, he, he was double teamed and everything, but he still ended up being drafted second round. So, I mean, he's doing well in the pros. And what's funny is when we talk about all these young wide receivers, and it all runs together after a while. So, the first thing I said, and I actually remember, what did Kirk do his freshman year? I mean, he was, you know, I hate to say it, I said to myself, oh, he was okay, wasn't he? He had 80 catches, you know, and I went back and looked and I go like, now he help of A&M had some great, great veteran receivers, which these young guys won't. But if there is a Christian Kirk in those red shirt freshmen or freshmen and they come on and you're not going to catch 80 in a Jimbo offense, they come on and catch 40. If one of those freshmen can be a Christian Kirk, then we talk about the unknowns. Then, you know, by the time they go to Auburn, go, what was that guy's name that didn't that come back for his senior, you know, senior year? I mean, I don't think that'll happen, but they have a lot of guys, like, uh, like Zach, you said, there's a lot of guys when you look at the redshirt freshmen and freshmen. So if one or two of those guys are anywhere close to Kirk, you think, I think a veteran quarterback can get him the ball. If what, if what uh, Alex said, if, He's not on his butt because the line's not blocking. Right. Yeah. Well, and Cease, you know, you brought it up about having a lot of guys now. But, you know, in the past, A&M, heck, go back to last year, Courtney Davis. You've got um, – oh, my gosh, the, the names escapes Kendrick me. Kendrick Rogers. Kendrick yeah, Rogers. Kendrick Rogers from Franklin uh, – from Frankston. You know, guys that declared early did not get drafted. And now I don't believe they're on any practice squads, if I'm not mistaken. But, you know, you've seen that with – players especially the wide receivers in the last few years all of those guys were recruited and signed by Kevin Sumlin including Jamon Osmond for this year do you think that trend's going to change with Jimbo and the guys that he recruits and brings into College Station well you know you look at he brought in you know not a wide receiver but Chase Sternberger you talk about and I'm with you Zach I thought you know let's go back Jimbo is still dealing with Kevin Sumlin's recruits and people go, Oh, you know, and I get it. They've been through, you know, two third year on Jimbo. They are his players, but yet he didn't recruit them. And, you know, he's got back to back top six classes into what you're saying, Zach is. And I kind of thought this when I looked up Kirk, okay, these are the receivers you recruited uh, Mr. Mr. Fisher, you know, and so you need a receiver there's about six or seven guys out there right now that are freshmen or redshirt freshmen that he recruited. So shouldn't one or two of those guys be able to step up and be a 40 catch guy. I'm just saying is they're his recruits and you're right. And I said the same thing. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what receivers do step up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, she made a great segue there a second ago. Uh, A&M does have a senior quarterback that can distribute the ball to these guys a lot of talk about what Kellen Mond can and can't do from the fan base. Does Kellen Mond have what it takes to win ball games to be that game manager that Jimbo Fisher wants this season? Um, or is it what a lot of the fan base is saying that, that they don't necessarily uh, trust his abilities? Zach, you've been going first. So I'll let you keep going first, big boy. Yeah. 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 Well, I can go ahead and do that. Um, I, <sighs> I really don't know, to tell you the truth, because last year, Kellen was supposed to take this extra step. You know, he came out in SEC media days and proclaimed, I'm the best quarterback in the SEC, or at least he thought he was, and, and that wasn't the case last year, obviously. Um, can he take that next step? He's got to have a line that's going to block for him, and that goes back to what Alex was saying. It's really what happens up front. Is he going to have enough time to make those reads and make those throws and I don't know why last year they were hesitant, whether he was or Jimbo was, or perhaps both hesitant to let him run. Um, you know, you saw it in the first half against Clemson. You saw it in the first half against Auburn when the, when the run game's not working in Georgia, when the run game's not working and 
he just re- doesn't run. I think if he is willing to use his legs from the get-go this year, I think that that will help him tremendously and help open up the passing game. Yeah, I'm with you. I think number one is he's got to use his legs more. And they got to throw, take more shots down the field, whether that means bringing some of these young wide receivers in because now you're not going to have as much threat at tight end with your two t- stud tight ends. But if, if he goes ahead and gets the blocking, that if he gets SEC blocking, then it's time for, for Kellen Mond to be one of the top two quarterbacks in this league. And if he doesn't get that blocking, and I felt he had, had a hand tied behind his arm last behind his back last year, because that line was so porous. And you could see, like in the old Miss game, when actually when Mond turned it on, but you could see he had like a deer in the headlights. He knew he was going to get hit. They couldn't get keep those guys out, and that was old Miss. And and eventually his athleticism, like you said, Zach, start running more, start scrambling. He can do that, but he's got to get the block. And if he gets the blocking with Jimbo calling plays and Wiedemeyer, and they, they got enough weapons, I feel, even so some of them young, if they get the blocking. And if he gets the blocking, then he does need to be a top two quarterback in this league. When you look what's coming back, him and Trask should be the top quarterbacks, the Florida guy. But is, is he going to get the blocking? But, you know, I don't, I don't know. When's the, you know, you got to go back to really uh, Johnny Manziel when you had those great blockers. We can say what a great quarterback Johnny Manziel was, but he had, he had, he had first round picks blocking for him. Uh, you know, so far, Kellen's had a lot of, hey, look out, you know, kind of blocking. So, you know. One, one thing that stuck out to me uh, hearing from Kellen this preseason him taking the next step and trusting himself and trusting others, having a self-confidence in himself, having self-confidence in his teammates. You know, we've seen Kellen be a little hesitant on throws, being a little hesitant going through the progressions, be a little hesitant deciding, should I take off and run? I've got an open lane. And now it's, he's got to trust, he's got to trust his own ability. He's got to trust his knowledge of Jimbo's complex offense and that complex system got to trust those wide receivers because he's lost his most trusted man I mean you think about Jamon Osmond they've been teammates going back till high school they've been roommates the last two years if there's anyone on the team that Kellen trusted it was probably Jamon and now he doesn't have that uh, calming presence we've seen in games before where Kellen was having a hard time and who was the guy he went to he went to Jamon back two years ago when they were about to lose the Ole Miss or they apart he threw three straight slants to Jamon that's not there anymore Um, so Kellen's got to be able to trust himself and it sounds like he's taking the right steps to do that now let's see if it translates to the field because when you're going against the Alabamas and the Floridas and the LSUs of the world you've got to trust your first year receiver to make that 50-50 catch against a guy like Derek Stingley of LSU and that that lot of trust and confidence in your guy to go and make those plays because those are the plays that are going to win you ball games in those big contests. So to kind of put a bow a little bit on this this Aggie roundtable for the My Aggie Nation podcast here, the the, the Eagle roundtable, what I'll open it up to y'all. What 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 questions, what thoughts do we have about this season that's important that 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 needs to uh to, to, to be addressed as we approach this first game against Vanderbilt? Oh gosh! Well, I'll change up and go for it. Go ahead. No, no, I'll no, change no, no, up. We, yep. we haven't talked about the defense, and mm-hmm. we all I think we all think Mike Elko is going to do a good job this year, and the defense is going to be solid. And you know, if you have a solid defense, then you can have some hiccups on offense. You know, you can have some growing pains. You you can weather some turnovers, particularly if they start you know forcing turnovers and make the other team nervous. We talked about Kellen Mond being nervous last year a lot. A lot of times, well, this is the third year for Elko. I think a lot of people feel this this defense is ready to take off because they've had so much potential on the line and so much potential in the secondary. It's time for those guys to come up and play like their counterparts do at LSU and Alabama. That's why those are such good teams because they make big plays. They make game 
deciding plays on defense at Alabama and LSU, even if the score is still 50 to 28, it's because their defense is coming up with plays. And maybe if A&M sees that, you know, we talked a lot about the offense because I, I think rightfully so, Osmond and Mon, but I think gone in, the defense is a given. And I'm, I'm, I've been proven wrong several times before, but the middle is solid with Hines and, you know, and Johnson. And if they get that talent in the front end and back end, then I think A&M could have a special season. Will this be the year that AM finally gets a little bit of a pass rush, basically since Miles Garrett left? I mean, you had a Justin Matty BK, but but basically having to, to, to carry the weight of the entire pass rush on your shoulders isn't necessarily a, an effective way to do that, especially no edge rushing. And we hear a lot about Michael Clemens. We hear a lot about Tyree Johnson and some of these guys and De, uh, uh, DeMarvin Leal, um, but but – We've heard about all these guys a lot the last three or four seasons and to see if one of those guys can actually step up and, and, and get some sacks and get some pressures. They're going to need it because Elijah Blades, um, who was projected to be one of the starting cornerbacks, is, is not going to be there. And you would think that they're at least in the first week or two, there might be a little deficiency uh, in the defensive secondary. So, yeah, uh, it, it kind of sees reminds me of the, the 2016 season a little bit. Um, I think A&M's offense is, is going to be good. Um, and, and a lot better than that offense was. But that was one of those seasons where um, the offense could really be stagnant at times and the defense won them some ball games. Yeah, I definitely think that the defense could be the calling card for this team, given you have a lot of proven commodities coming back and there's still a bunch of question marks on the offense. I mean, like you said, Leal comes back. He had a strong second half of the season last year. PV was game Bobby Brown's getting a lot of hype going into the season he's very disruptive in the middle they've got options with Clemens and Johnson and I mean you go down the list that they have too deep and what's been an issue the last two years it's been the secondary well they finally have depth in the secondary they have veteran experience and they also have very young talented guys think about Damani Richardson he started every game last year as a true freshman Jalen Jones comes in as a five-star so they've got a lot of options a lot of guys are very acquainted with this Elko system. And so, yeah, the defense kind of – it could be the calling card of the team, and it could really help a and win some games where the offense is having a hard time putting points on the board when they're, they're uh, coming back and forcing three and outs and keeping points off the board on defense. Yeah, they did have depth in that secondary, and then they had two guys opt out. So suddenly, suddenly it's not nearly as deep as it was. I, I think that might be an issue. But how about just the overall picture in Jimbo Fisher now working with his guys? And I, I get it. He said that they're all his guys. But I'm talking about the guys he recruited, the guys that he brought to Aggieland. They're now big playmakers. They've been there for three seasons. They understand what he expects. Is A&M going to take the next step under Jimbo Fisher, who has got an enormous contract right now? I mean, I think that the pressure is finally on for, for Jimbo. You know, so far it's been kind of a honeymoon phase in Aggieland, and everybody's saying, well, you know, maybe we're not getting the results that we want, but give him time. He's building his team. Now that it's in the third year, it's kind of where the rubber meets the road. And depending on how the season goes, I mean, suddenly you could be talking about, well, Jimbo Fisher was worth every penny, or you can be talking about, wow, we, we really got scammed out of a lot of money if you're A&M because these aren't the results we're paying for. We're paying for championship stop caliber results, and we're not getting them. So, I mean, I, I, from that standpoint, just the overall, how is Jimbo Fisher going to take that team to the next level? Is he going to take the team to the next level? Uh, that's kind of what I'm keeping an eye on this year. Well, let's go around the corner real quick before we wrap this up. Season record predictions. Zach, go. Oh, uh, again, there's only 10 games. I am going to say – I'm going to say seven and three in the regular season. All right. Cease. Going to keep true to this. I already put this out for next week. Six and three, they're going to lose a game to COVID. Interesting. Okay. Oh. Alex, Go. I'm going seven and three, too. Um, 
too too many unknowns. If you'd asked me before Jamon opted out, I might have said eight and two, but uh, I'm going seven and three now. I'm gonna still stick with what I said. I think it's eight and two. I think this this AM team does have a lot of a lot of weapons, a lot of talent. I think some of these freshmen are gonna be able to step up and 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 make some big adjustments. And I think that the veteran leadership on this team it, it's it's a decently young SEC right now. And when you go back and look at the importance of doing the little things like getting in the training room, um, staying away from parties, doing the, how much of an importance that's going to play into having a successful season, successful season as much as your passes, your catches, your tackles. I think the veteran savvy of this team will, will that that'll be good enough for for a win. So give me eight and two. Uh, go ahead, Cease. Hope you're right, Travis. Because here's the deal, as all of us will agree, we're ready to go cover a New Year's Six Bowl. And that got a little tougher with the Big Ten coming back, less spots. So eight and two might need to be to get to a New Year's Six Bowl. There you go. There you go. Well, big thanks to Alex Miller, Robert Cessna, of course, for joining us for this for this uh, uh, Kill two, two Birds with One Stone Zoom podcast preview. Um, also, of course, Zach Taylor, who's here every week. So, no. you know. Yeah. Anyway, so for, other it looks the same every week. It looks there the you same. go. There you go. So for this crew, uh, I'm Travis Brown. This is the My Aggie Nation podcast. We'll see you next week on Game Week. It's.